invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> we'll pick up where we left off last time. <clears throat> we are to come to the next to the last chapter of the book of Luke, of this great gospel. And uh, we have found it to be an amazing gospel. And we are at the very end as we're moving towards the crucifixion, moving towards right now we're in the trials and then eventually the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And those will be in the coming weeks. But we find ourselves in the midst of the trials of Jesus. I'm talking about the religious trials and the civil trials of Christ. I have had the privilege of serving on a jury a couple of times in my life. And I uh, remember the thing that is emphasized most of all when you are serving on a jury in our court system and that is that a person is innocent until they are proven guilty. And the second thing that they emphasize in that is that everybody's entitled to a fair trial. And that is why they will go through all these deliberations of trying to get a jury seated. Uh, they'll spend a lot of time questioning people to get a jury so they can have a fair trial. Those are two things that are pillars of our legal system. And you will hear that emphasized over and over if you've ever been in our court system doing anything. Um, I don't know if you realize it or not, but our system, our judicial system, uh, a lot of it came from ancient Rome. Uh, they had basically same system, same concerns about justice in the Roman system. They had a high view of legal justice. Roman officials had on their desk, we're told by historians, a statue of their god, Janus. Janus was a god that could see in front of him and he could see behind him. He had two faces. And the point was, he, he represented what they wanted their judicial system to be all about, that you looked at both sides looked at both sides of the charges, both sides of the crime, of the, of the accused in the situation, considering all sides to it. We call the first month of our year January. It comes from that God's name uh, because it's the first month of the year. We look back and we look forward in January, supposedly. But the point is that's how they viewed their system to be fair and wanted to be fair. And... Uh, the passage we're looking at today is a Roman trial. We're going to see Roman justice at work, um, at least in the beginning stages of it. It eventually goes south, uh, but we're going to see the attempts by a man named Pilate, who was the governor of the region representing the Roman Empire. He was the governor, the Roman governor of this region, and he uh, does seek Roman justice. He probably had a statue on his desk. But um, unfortunately, because of the religious leaders, the religious leaders of Israel, there were three trials already prior to the one we're going to look at here where they had basically thrown out their jurisprudence. They basically had violated all of their laws taken from Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus and all of the laws that defined the legal system of Judea of Israel um, so that they basically because they were so driven to kill Christ if there's anything that stands out from the trials of Christ before the religious leaders it's that they wanted him dead and they didn't really look for uh, they, they had a verdict they just need to find a crime and they spent three trials trying to determine that but before I read the, go further in this, let's read the passage we're looking at this morning. In beginning in verse 1 of Luke chapter 23, it says, The whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept insisting, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. 
When Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And verse 7, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. As I said, we are in the midst of what is called Passion Week, the week of suffering for Christ, where Christ is going to suffer and be beaten and, and scourged and eventually be crucified on a cross and leads to his burial and resurrection, of course. But the religious trials were in three phases. The civil trials will be in three phases as well. You had the trial before Annas. You had the, tri- the, the uh, former high priest. You had the trial before Caiaphas in the middle of the night with the religious leaders. And then you had the daytime trial with Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin to make things look legal. They did a daytime trial because nighttime trials were illegal. And then you're going to now enter into three phases of a civil trial. You're going to have this trial we see here this morning before Pilate. Then he's going to go before Herod. And then he's going to come back to Pilate. And folks, we're talking about really fast. We're talking about since 1 a.m. Friday morning till noon when he would be put on the cross on Friday till 3 when he will be dead on the cross. So this is really fast moving. It's taken us a few weeks to get through it, but it's really fast moving. It really is. Luke's, Luke just gives us a summary in these seven verses. Um, you have to put all the gospel writers together to really get the full picture, and that's what I'm going to do eventually this morning because I think it's just... Uh, pretty fascinating, really fascinating to see how these trials were conducted. But all four Gospels contain parts of this scene. And um, you just put all the Gospel writers together and you get the full picture of everything. That's how, it's, yeah, that's how it is. When you look at the Scripture, they bring it all together. There's a question that, that Pilate asks Uh, in Matthew. He doesn't ask it here, but he asks it in Matthew. The question is this, what should I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And it's very interesting because Pilate thinks, you know, he's a very powerful man, and he is a very powerful man. I'll tell you more about him in a moment. He's a very powerful man. He's a governor, the Roman governor. He represents Caesar in this region and the authority of the Roman Empire in this region. And so he believes he wields great authority and And he didn't mind demonstrating his power from time to time. But the truth is, and this is something you must understand as we go through the trial, is nobody can do anything to Jesus except God. Understand that. Nobody can do anything to Jesus except God. He is sovereign over all the events of this Passion Week. There is nothing that catches him by surprise. He is absolutely in control of everything. It pleases the Lord to crush him. It pleases the Lord to crush Jesus. We're told that. His sovereign hand, predetermined plan of God. But it is interesting when you um, read verse like this. I'll read, don't have to turn there, but in John 19, 10 through 11, Pilate says, you do speak to me. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you? Pilate saying that to Jesus. Don't you know I have the authority to release you? And I have the authority to crucify you. And Jesus says, Get this, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Boy, that is, a, that is powerful. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. But the point is, you got people, MacArthur in his commentary notes this point. I thought this was good. The irony in the betrayal and trials of Jesus is you have a lot of corrupt characters who believe they're very self-directed in the, in the role of the death of Jesus. You have Judas, who's doing his thing, and who purposely does what he does. You have Annas, who is the power behind the temple system, doing what he does, thinking he's the one in power, he's the one that's controlling things. You have Caiaphas, who's the current high priest, and he is doing what he does, and he thinks he's all-powerful, and he's the judge of Israel. And then you have the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin of Israel, and they think 
they have all the authority and the power in their hands. And then now you have Pilate, and then you're going to have Herod, and they all weigh in on the case of Jesus. But the truth of the matter is, no matter what they thought, they do not determine the destiny of Jesus. They do not determine it. They think they do, but they do not. The, the interesting point, they are not determining Jesus' destiny, but they are determining their own destiny, correct? Their decisions make no difference in the destiny of Jesus. Their decisions, however, make a huge difference in their own destinies. And that's true of everyone in this room. Listen, you, are, you think you judge Jesus. You think you make judgments about Jesus. Is he what I want? Does he meet my needs? Is he the Messiah I think he should be? Does he fit all of my qualifications for a God who is worthy of my worship. No, he is not on judgment. You are, and I am. It's how I respond to him. That is a very, very powerful point. Listen to this from John chapter 5. Truly, I truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. You want eternal life, you believe in Jesus. And you don't come into judgment when you believe in Jesus. You pass out of death into life. The hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and all who hear will live. Sinners live with the illusion that they can make judgments about Jesus. But ju Jesus is the judge. This is their hour this is their, uh, their hour. The Son of Man, no one takes his life. He gives it up. Very important points to always keep in mind about Jesus. The question is, what will you do when you stand before him? Will it be heaven or will it be hell? That's the question. Will it be heaven or will it be hell? He is the judge. So in Luke chapter 23, the judges of Israel bring Jesus before Pilate. I told you before, he, has, he was betrayed late Thursday evening by Ju, uh, Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. They take him prisoner uh, just, before, just after midnight. He goes to the house of Annas. You will read about that in John's account, John 18. He goes to the house of Annas, the former high priest, in those early hour mornings, trying to get, the Jews are trying to get an indictment. They'd already decided a week before that he has to die. He has to die. They will take our place. The Romans will take our place. He's popular with the people. We've got, he's, he must die. So the verdict is already decided. These nighttime trials of the Jews are simply to find an indictment, simply to find the charges, things to charge him with. And as I said to you before, these are illegal trials by, Roman, by Jewish standards, by Jewish law. Illegal trials in the middle of the night at somebody's house. The, the, the judges are acting as prosecutors. They're not acting as judges who weigh evidence. They're acting as prosecutors making charges. They're bringing false witnesses, all kinds of violations in these Jewish courts, all kinds of violations to their sense of fairness about what a trial should be and how it should be conducted. They decide by three in the morning that he is to die, but to make things legal and to put up a facade, they have a daylight trial. Notice in your Bible there, Luke 22, look at verse, 20, look at verse 66 in the previous chapter. When it was day. You see that? As I told you last week, Luke does not record the nighttime trial. He jumps to the daytime trial, the early morning trial, the, quote, legal trial. So it's another meeting of the Sanhedrin. They've already met before. This is a mock trial in Luke 22. It's the third trial, the second trial before the Sanhedrin. The charge is blasphemy. He claims to be God. May, swear to us. They say, swear to us that you are the Son of God. Swear to us that you are the Messiah, the Christ. And he does. He does. 
the Jews knew he claimed to be God. Liberals today don't believe he ever claimed to be God. The Jews knew he claimed to be God, making himself equal to God. That was the claim. That is the blasphemy for which they charge him. And now they are carting him over to the Romans because they need the Romans in order to carry out capital punishment. And that brings us to chapter 23. The problem is blasphemy is not going to work in a Roman court. The Romans don't care about blasphemy. They don't care if this man claims to be God or whoever. They don't care about religious matters. What's the capital offense going to be? And that's the issue as we come to chapter 23. And they come before Pilate, you see, in verse 1 of chapter 23. The whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. Verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Oh, did you catch that, Pilate? Telling people not to pay taxes to Caesar. And making himself out as a king. Insurrectionist. There you got it, Pilate. That's all you need. Capital offense, do your job. They want Pilate to buy into the idea that he is a threat to Rome. That is it. And it's your duty, Pilate, to protect Roman power, to keep Roman Pax Romana, to keep Roman peace. I want you to hold your hand now in Luke, and I want you to turn over to John 18. I want to fill in some details here because this is a summary. I just want to give you some details. Don't lose Luke. We'll be right back. But John 18, verse 28. In verse 28 of John 18, this, this is just repeating verse 28. It's repeating what you saw in Luke 23 where they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium. They led Jesus into the praetorium and it was early and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. So you, you've got 71 members of the Sanhedrin. This is probably the largest gathering of the Sanhedrin in the presence of Pilate. I don't know that you normally had the whole Sanhedrin show up in this presence of Pilate. But nonetheless, they're all there. And... Uh, and from the dialogue you're about to, we're about to look at here, you, you see and you sense that they don't get along. Pilate and the religious leaders don't get along very well. Pilate has been the governor since 26 AD. He will stop his reign in a few years, 37 AD. So he's been reigning for a while as governor. He's been in that office for some time now, a few years now. And one of the things that Josephus and others would say that characterized, the historian would say that characterized, uh, excuse me, Pilate was that he had very insensitive to Jewish customs. One time he brought his soldiers into the city with shields that had the image of Caesar on them. Well, there was an uprising about that because that's just idolatry, that's images because they believed in Caesar worship. That's a false god. And so that stirred up concern. Another time, he stole money from the temple treasury to build an aqueduct to get water into the city. That didn't go over too well either. In Luke chapter 13, you can turn there if you want or just listen closely. Luke 13, it says, On the same occasion there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with the sacrifices. There were some Galileans who were offering sacrifices. Pilate killed them and their blood was mixed with the sacrifices that they were performing. So he killed some Jews in that incredible moment of offering sacrifices. Another time, he brought Roman standards or banners into the city and put them all over the city of Jerusalem. And they, 
There was a riot about that. Once again, the image of Caesar. And they went to Caesarea. That's where Pilate normally is. He's just in Jerusalem because of the Passover season, and it's always a volatile time. So we find him in Jerusalem right now. But he's usually in Caesarea, which is the Roman capital of the region. And these Jewish leaders go over there and complain. And he gets really weary of their complaining. And he puts them all in an arena and threatens to kill them all. To which they just say, cut off our heads, we don't care. See, they, they've already gone to Rome twice about him. They've already gone to Tiberius a couple of times about him. And Tiberius has warned Pilate, get along. Keep the peace. This is a very volatile region. You have volatile people. And so there's fear in Pilate's mind, of course, that he's sort of on probation with Tiberius. That they could easily go and report something else. These men know this. These men know this as they come and stand before Pilate. They know the history. They know this man has done things, and they know the warnings from Tiberius. They know that all he's got to do is pack up and go back up there again. So they know they've got a little leverage here. But in verse, excuse me, in verse um, 29, Caiaphas leads Jesus to this praetorium. It's just after dawn. They've just finished all three of these sham trials, religious trials. Big, big hurry to get this done. Jesus has popularity, so they want to do this fast. They don't want a lot of public exposure here, though there, is, there are public, this is a very public trial. Jesus will be dead by the middle of the afternoon when the Passover lambs are sacrificed. You know, we're on God's timetable too, by the way. On God's timetable, Jesus is the Lamb of God, and by three o'clock, he will die at the same time lambs in the temple are being sacrificed because he's a picture of all of that. They are, they are, excuse me, they are a picture of, his real, of the reality of who he is. And so notice it says they don't want to go into the praetorium. See that in verse 20, 28? They don't want to go into the praetorium. Think of the hypocrisy here. Think of the ceremonial hypocrisy here. Think of the religious hypocrisy here. They don't want to go in there because they don't want to defile themselves. They don't want to defile themselves because they're going to be partaking of the Passover meal later that day. Think of the hypocrisy of that. They are given, they're given to external ritual, but not to moral, moral defilement. They're going to kill Jesus. They're going to kill someone whom they have ramrodded a verdict on and falsely accused. They have butchered justice and determined they're going to kill the Messiah. Listen, this is how false hypocritical religion works. Keep me busy with all the externals, and I never have to think about the true moral defilements that are going on in my life. This has happened in the Roman Catholic, this happens everywhere, but in the Roman Catholic Church, let me use that as an example, where you have priests performing all the functions of a priest week after week after week, and, on their, and their moral lives are in shams. You follow me? Straining a gnat and swallowing a camel. That's what Jesus called it. A hypocritical religion doesn't save you. A hypocritical religion will not save you. Hypocritical religion, external ritual, will not make you right with God. And there are thousands and, th and billions of people on this planet that think it will. It will not. These men don't want to go in the praetorium, don't want to get defiled. It's a Gentile thing. Don't want to get around that. All of a sudden they get religious. The whole Sanhedrin show up, verse 29 of John 18. 
Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate has been told they have a criminal. Pilate is probably aware that things have been going on with Jesus in the middle of the night because he is the one that would have had the Roman cohort sent to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest him. So he is probably aware that something is going on here. But the first legal act takes place in that sentence right there, verse 29. What accusation do you bring against this man? That is the first legal act. Everything else up to now has been accusations. He is asking a question. What are the charges? What are the charges? That's the first legitimate thing. to open. And he opens the trial right. He's not serving as prosecutor like the religious leaders did. He is serving, I'm the judge. What are the charges? And they don't, they're not prepared to mention a crime, evidently, because they get all bent out of shape that he asked them the question. They don't have anything to support the claim. And so with sarcasm, verse 30, they answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. See that? You think, what are you thinking, Pilate? They impugn him. They, they basically, why would you ask that kind of question? Obviously, he's done something wrong. Why else would he be here? Why else would we go to all this trouble to show up before you? And one thing we are told that Peter, that, that, excuse me, that Pilate knows is that these men, that, that this man Jesus has attacked their religion. He knows that. He knows that that he has attacked their leadership. He knows. He knows based on Matthew 27, 18. For he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. He knew that these religious leaders were envious of Jesus. Matthew 27, 18 says, Pilate is not convinced that any actual crime has been committed by Jesus. He thinks this is all based on envy. Based on the fact that that he has gained popularity with the people. He has attacked their religious system. He went and overturned all the tables in the temple earlier in the week. He attacked their teaching as he walked through the temple earlier in the week. And he doesn't want to get backed into a corner by these guys. Verse 31 of John 18 Pilate said to him, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Take him, take him and judge him according to your law. This is kind of interesting. If you thought, if you thought that this man was a rival to Caesar and that this man was trying to get your people from paying taxes to Caesar, You wouldn't be bringing him before me. You would make a hero out of him. Follow me? You wouldn't be... He knows this. You guys don't like Rome that much. You you don't like paying taxes. You 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 find somebody that will stand up and say, don't pay taxes to Rome. And this guy is anti-Caesar. You would think the Jews would like that. Pilate knows something fishy is going on here. These guys, what this guy put to death because of that? He would be a hero if he was really a threat to Rome. So judge him according to your laws. And you, see, you would think that that is what they would want to happen. But they come back and say, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. They don't mind violating all the other laws of their own justice, their own jurisprudence. They don't mind violating all those laws, but now they're all concerned about violating Roman laws. Capital punishment. We want to uphold this Roman law thing you've got called capital punishment. You see the duplicity here? If you thought he was such a threat, it seems like you would just want to take him out and kill him. They didn't do crucifixions. Romans did crucifixions. They did stoning. It's interesting. A few weeks later, 
Um, a few months later, from this event, we're going to find Stephen getting all in uproar. What do they do? They stone him. <laughs> no Roman capital punishment there. Now, granted, that was not a Sanhedrin trial there. It was a mob violence there. But here they don't want to disobey Roman law. They were afraid of the people. They want to get this out of their own hands. They want the Romans to take care of the problem. Verse 32 of John 18, to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying what kind of death he was about to die. So basically, they're saying... We're not permitted to put anyone to death. We want you to do it because you can do capital punishment. We cannot. But the even bigger reason behind the words they're expressing there is found in verse 32. It's because Jesus said he was going to die by crucifixion, not stoning. They were fulfilling Jesus' words. Luke 18, 32, for he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be handed over to the non-Jews and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. Psalm 22 says, they pierce my hands and my feet. Zechariah 12, 10 says, a future generation of Jews will look on him whom they have pierced. John 12, 32, I will be lifted up not thrown down to be stoned. I will be lifted up and I will draw all men to myself. And John goes on to explain that he was talking about how he would die by crucifixion. So though you would think they might want to just take care of things in their own hands, really behind it all is fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus' own words. God's own words. They weren't determining anything. They thought they were. They thought they were determining everything. But it's up to God. Now, you still got your hand in Luke chapter 23. Don't lose Luke. Don't lose John 18. Go to Luke 23. And you see in verse 2, we found this man misleading our nation. Verse 2 of Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 2, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Christ means Messiah, the king. And so they came up with this crime, like I said earlier, because they know blasphemy is not going to work. They say he's a revolutionary. We know he was not. Hey, they tried to make him king back in John chapter 6. He wouldn't take the crown, remember? He told people, Pay your taxes. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, to God what is God's. He never said those things. False charges. But hey, that's your typical anti-Roman insurrectionist stuff. And they want to get Jesus on the cross. This is the agenda of the religious leaders of Israel. That is the point here. That is the agenda of the leaders of Israel. I'm not saying every Jew, but... That is what the religious leaders of Israel wanted to happen is for Jesus to die. I know that's unpopular to say sometimes, but it's true. The religious leaders of Israel wanted Jesus to die. Yes, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Yes, the Romans put him on a cross. Yes, my sin put him there. Yes, all that is true. But the reality is the religious leaders of Israel wanted him dead. Not every Jew. There were some Jews that believed in him. But the religious leaders of Israel in the time that Jesus was here wanted him dead. Pilate takes him into, okay, back to John. You're in Luke. Don't lose Luke. Go back to John. Verse 33 of John 18 Pilate goes into a private conversation with Jesus. Back in the Praetorium, verse 33 of John 18, and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And he looked at Jesus with no palace, no army, no followers, no institutions, no nothing. Just the clothes on his back. No one there to defend him. 
This sounds ridiculous, but let me ask it. Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? In other words, he is saying this, this is what he means by that statement, folks. He is saying, am I on the most wanted list in Rome? Is this something that you, uh, you Romans have heard about me, that I am an insurrectionist, that I am a threat to Rome? Am I on some list to watch out for Jesus, this insurrectionist? Is that your charge or is that what you have heard others say about me? Do you really think I am a threat to you? In other words, he's pointing once again that this is really not a Gentile issue. This is a Jewish issue. They do not determine that Jesus is a threat to Rome. He's he's not some rival king to Caesar. Jesus is saying, do you have evidence that I am a threat to Rome? That's what that question is asking. Verse 35, Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your nation and your chief priest delivered you to me. What have, I, what have you done? I don't have any clue what crime you've committed. I'm just, this is not my issue. And that's one thing again, emphasizing the relentless rejection of the leaders of Israel who always killed the prophets are going to kill Jesus. God's messengers, they don't want to lose their place. They don't want to lose their influence. They don't want to lose their power. This was never a Roman agenda. It's your own people. That's what, Paul, that's what Pilate is saying. If, if their accusations are true, I have no evidence. Later, he's going to wash the second trial before Pilate, third trial of the civil government. Next, last trial, he's going to wash his hands. His blood be on you, telling the Jewish leaders. Verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would be handed over to the Jews. So I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. I think there's a little evangelism going on here personally. To Pilate, very possible. But basically what he is saying, yes, I have a kingdom, but it's not of this world. It's invisible. I am a king, Luke says. Luke 23 says, I am a king. But it's not the kind of kingdom you understand. There would have been a big fight in the garden if I was of this world, but I am not. My kingdom is not a temporary kingdom like the kingdoms of this world. Mine is a spiritual kingdom. It is made up of those who submit to my sovereign rule. Pilate said to him, verse 37, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. There's the evangelism I was talking about. I have been born and come into this world and everyone who who is of truth hears my voice. If you're of the truth, you hear his voice. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? He'd heard the Romans and Greeks batting that question around for centuries. It still echoes today, doesn't it? What is truth? Everybody's still trying to find out what truth is. Here Pilate has standing before him the the truth, standing in front of him. But he does not hear his voice. You follow me? He has the truth right there in front of him, but he does not hear his voice. We as believers, we start with this book for truth. We aren't caught up in the circular reasoning of the world. The everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Or truth is some personal thing to everybody, but it's different. No, there's one truth. Go back to Luke 23. We'll close with this. Luke 23, verse 4. 
The point is that, oh, excuse me, I didn't tell you, but I'll just read this to you. Go to Luke 24. He says, he goes out and he says, I find no guilt in him. That's his verdict. I find no guilt in him. That's the decision that is made in the end of John 18, verse 38, and told the Jews that. Now, 23, 4, Pilate said to the chief priest, I find no guilt in this man. See the parallel? 23, 4. That's the verdict. And it's important that the records stand at this point. He's no insurrectionist. That's the point. He's not trying to build some power base to overthrow the Roman government. The whole charge was invented by the relentless religious leaders who want him dead. If he were a threat, Pilate would have killed him. He would have killed him. He would have wasted no time to do that. Back up to verse 3 of Luke 23. Pilate asked him that question. So the interrogation, you see the same interrogation that went on here in Luke 23. Go back down to verse 5. But they, the religious leaders, kept insisting he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee even as far as this place. Do your job, Pilate. Do your job. Behind those words are, or we might have to make a trip to see Caesar again. But you're not dealing with an insurrectionist. And so they're driven by that. Pilate knows he's innocent, but he's afraid of the Jews. He has a sense of justice at this point anyway. But there's two more trials to go. But he sees a way out of this trap. He sees that in verses 6 and 7 when Pilate... Pilate heard what he said in verse 5, that he does this in Galilee. Whoa, starting from Galilee. See that word Galilee? That means one thing, out of my jurisdiction. Out of my jurisdiction. And he says, here's my way out. I'm going to send him to Herod Antipas. Go see Herod. And that's how he gets rid of him. Send him to Herod. Herod is sort of a petty king, but he sends him to Herod, who happens to be in Jerusalem at this time as well. What I want you to understand in all this is the innocence and purity of Jesus. He is the perfect lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It is proven in two, in four trials that he is innocent. The lamb of God had to be innocent, and he was innocent. He was innocent. To die in your place and in my place, You had to be innocent because I'm not innocent and you're not innocent. But he is innocent. And that's why he can be my substitute and that is why he can go to the cross and and die in my place and God can say, satisfied. My law is fulfilled. The penalty of death has been satisfied in Christ. And whoever puts their faith in Jesus passes from death unto life. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you, Father, for these great truths from the pages of Luke. What a tremendous event this must have been to all those who saw it firsthand. It's a tremendous event to us who read it this morning. We thank you and praise you that our Lord went to the cross for us, that he delivered his own life up for us, put himself through all of this nonsense, these Sham kangaroo courts for us to take our sin to satisfy your wrath and your judgment. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.